Today, as we continue our renewal series, I want to talk about having a renewed perspective. You know, when you're a follower of God, when you're a Christian, uh, we don't think about things the same way that the rest of the world uh, might think, and and really we can't because we are following uh, God's pattern for the way of life, uh, the way that God has told us things are, uh, the way things actually are, because God is speaking from a position of truth. Uh, he represents absolute truth, and that is something that we can be confident of uh, in Christ Jesus to know that we serve the awesome, mighty God that represents this truth. And so today we're going to talk about renewing our perspective, and this is going to be through a godly lens. We're going to be looking at things through God's eyes, through the way that he has set things up. And a lot of these things will not necessarily make sense maybe to mankind, but they are the way uh, things God intended them to be. They are the way that God set things up. Uh, and they are the way that we as uh, God's people, as Christians, that we are to think. And so we're just going to mention several things today. I think we have seven or eight things uh, we want to mention today that we need to uh, think about as we re uh, renew our perspective. And really, there's so many more that we could talk about. But the first one I want to talk about is our perspective of God. You know, there's so many people in our world that they do not believe in God, that they don't believe that uh, he even exists. Uh, and some want to believe in God, but they, they believe in, uh, you know, many little G gods and, you know, in different religions uh, that are around the world, I uh, believe in, in various form of God. But what we know to be true and what is true is the God of the Bible. The same God that in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We see that in the beginning, you know, before there was time, before there was anything, that God existed uh, and that he is true. And you see that that shown out not only in the scripture, because scripture is it is a great, uh, you know, work where we can see, you know, the existence of God in that, but really in all creation and evidences uh, and evidences that is in creation, the evidence that's in history, and evidence that's, that you can find uh, through, uh, you know, uh, pr predictive prophecy and so many things where you can go and dive into uh, to show the existence of God. We as Christians, we as people that follow God, we have to have a new perspective. We have to have a different perspective than the rest of the world. We see things as truth. We see things as God intended them to be. And so we know that there is a God. And not only there is a God, but there's a oneness to God. Um, as we mentioned a moment ago, there are many religions in our world that talk about, you know, multiple gods or, you know, different gods of this and that. But what we see in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6 as well as many other places, uh, God is one. You see uh, mentioned in, in there multiple things that are one. Uh, oneness is a very popular thing when you look into to the scripture. Uh, oneness of so many things, but within that you're going to see, you know, the oneness, uh, the one Lord. You're going to see a, a one God and Father, uh, and so you're going to see that there's the oneness of God. And so we have to change our perspective of things when we think about God, think about the way things are. We have to, 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 to turn it to the way, to a godly perspective, to the way that, that God uh, has uh, set things up, to the way he is structured. And we have to come to know God as he is, uh, as he is, he is God and he is one. Also, our perspective on uh, creation, you know, uh, creation is real. Creation is, is not just a way we think. Uh, it, is, it is real. But there's a lot of people in the world, they don't believe in creation. Uh, that's one of the reasons they challenge that they're being a God because, it, uh, and as they would say, their perspective is that uh, there is not a God, therefore creation uh, can't be the way that everything came into existence. But since we know through evidences uh, and, and also supported in the scripture that there is a God, we also see within the scripture that uh, that all things were created. That in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we go on down through that first chapter of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, we see that he completed this, this action uh, in six literal days. And it says evening and morning. You had a six 24-hour periods that God created the world. Uh, and I know we're kind of playing loosely with the word perspective because uh, that's kind of tying into our viewpoint. But the reality is, is all we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to show today that through things, we have to have a, a godly view of things. And we, and we can't let the world or we can't let even what we call science, uh, even though science is supposed to be proven, uh, we can't let science uh, you know, try to distract us because the reality is, is that when you put God and his word to the test, it passes every time. Not only passes, it is 
completely and totally true and accurate. And so we need to have a godly perspective at, at all, not only God, but also at creation. Now, diving from that, that means that our viewpoint and our perspective of talking about mankind is going to probably be different than the rest of the world because especially in today's world, uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, people being, um, you know, some people believe that, you know, since they don't believe God exists, they don't believe creation is real, uh, and therefore uh, they believe that mankind has uh, has arrived in some different uh, way. And honestly, if you follow that out, that, that puts us on the same level as every animal that's, that's on this earth, which really has some uh, really, uh, you know, dangerous ways of thinking if you, if you, if you put that uh, like that. But you think about mankind, the Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says that, that mankind was made in the image of God. He made them both male and female. Uh, and that is something that we need to, to understand as Christians, is that God not only created mankind, but he made them both male and female. And then his purpose for that was for, for those uh, two to come together uh, to be husband and wife. And so when we think about mankind, uh, there, is, uh, there is true gender. Uh, there is, uh, you know, for, biologically speaking, there are, there are men and there are women. Uh, you know, and it's not about what the world likes to talk about identity. Uh, it's not what they identify as. There is there is gender, uh, and is based on biology. It's based on the way God set things up and the way God uh, has structured things. Uh, and we need to know that, that first and foremost, we're made in the image of God. Uh, we talk about Psalm chapter one thirty nine verse fourteen that were fearfully and wonderfully made. And we need to understand that. We need to help the rest of the world to understand that. And yes, there are going to be people that struggle with different types of struggles, and we need to help them in their struggles and help them to see uh, themselves as God sees them uh, and help them to know that they are loved, help them to know that they are cared for, uh, and help them to get their life on the right path. And so we think about that, that we have to put things back into a godly perspective in the way that God sees them, in the way that God has set them up. And so there is only male and female, and that is what God has structured. That is what God has created and he made. And it says he made them fear, uh, fearfully and uh, wonderfully made uh, that we are. And that leads us on to our perspective on marriage uh, you know, we think about marriage, you know, marriage in, in our world today uh, is uh, people are trying to pr uh, pervert that, corrupt that, uh, and say all kinds of things about what marriage is. But God is the one that established marriage. God is the one that set that up. God is the one that that, that made so. In Genesis chapter 2 and verses 21 through 25, you see that God uh, said that it was not good for man to be alone. And so God made uh, from uh, Adam's side, took the rib, uh, and he formed a woman, and he brought this woman to the man, and they were becoming a husband and wife, they become one flesh. Um, and then you go on within that context, and you see that uh, that the man is to, is to leave his father and mother. He's going to cleave to his wife. That man and woman is what God intended for marriage. And, and as you look throughout all of scripture, what you're going to see that God, God intended one man, one woman for life. And that's why you come to Matthew chapter 19 and verses four through nine in the discussion of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and you see there with Matthew chapter nineteen and verses four through nine that, that God never uh, He never wanted uh, you know the, the, uh, divorce. He never wanted that to be as far as what was happening under the days of Moses. Uh, he said that, that these things uh, were not uh, were not to be uh, like this. Um, that God always intended one man, one woman for life, and the only reason you see there in Matthew chapter nineteen and other places in Scripture uh, for marriage, divorce, and remarriage was because of adultery, because of an unfaithful uh, spouse. And so marriage is to be one man, one woman for life. That is the godly perspective. That is the way God set things up, and that is to be our perspective as well. And, and going off from that, you go to like Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 22 to 25, and what we see here is the way their marriage is to set up that the husband uh, is the the, uh, the head of the family. Uh, he, he's the head there, uh, you know, with the wife, as it says there in Ephesians chapter 5 there in verse 22 and following, uh, the wife is in submission, but you also see that the husband is loving. 
The, lo- the husband loves uh, his wife as Christ loves the church. And so you see really a very complementary relationship that's going on here uh, that God does not set man as the head of the church to, uh, or the head of not the church, the head of his family or, and over his wife um, as domineering, uh, as someone that is, uh, you know, controlling or abusive or anything like that. This is the way God intended uh, marriage to be. Uh, and it is, it is a beautiful structure uh, that God has set up. And it's something that we need to, you know, know, promote, promote the ways of God, promote the things that God has set up, that God has established, and let that be our way of thinking. Um, and then, you know, moving on from some of these topics today, we're, we're going to talk about Christianity in general. You know, the word Christ, Christian gets uh, misused and abused so many times. It gets uh, thrown around, to, and so many people uh, like to use it. And, and Christian is really the, one of the most beautiful terms uh, when you're talking about uh, you know, who we are, that we belong to Christ. We are his followers. We are his people. And Acts chapter 2 and verses 40 through 47, you know, you see that there on the day of Pentecost, you know, this great gospel sermon, they have just been told to repent and be baptized. And then in more words, it was it was told to, uh, to these people, you know, to be saved from this perverse generation. And it says that that day, that you're gonna that you had that those souls that they were they were baptized they were baptized for the remission of their sins as as he talked about uh, uh, there in verses uh, forty and following uh, you know that this is what what happened and that you see in verse forty seven uh, that that this same group that was baptized that was added to them it says was added to the church you know, by the Lord that's verse forty seven it talks about that that those that are being saved are added to the church by the Lord. And what's so beautiful about that is you can go on to Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, and you see there uh, that, that within this it says, and when they found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And so you can kind of draw this together that you have the church, that is, is filled with people that are saved, that's filled with people that have been baptized for their mission and their sins, that have been added to the church by the Lord, and that these people, these disciples, these followers were called Christians. And that's what Christians are. Christians are followers of God that have been added to the Lord's church because they have, in obedient baptism, have put on Christ and the, and the Lord has added them to his church. That is what is uh, to, uh, is our perspective, is our viewpoint, is the truth. Uh, let, let's, let's go beyond that, is the truth about what true Christianity really is. And we need to hold that viewpoint and hold that uh, to be strong uh, because it's one of those things that when we start going out into the world and we see and we start labeling everyone as Christian, um, yes, people follow God, but if they're not following God the way He intended, you know, they're they're not they're not following Him. They're not really following after the God uh, the way He structured it, and and they're not part of of that that family if they have not put Him on a baptism, and they have not been washed clean, uh, and they, they have not been added by the Lord. The Lord is the one that does the adding. The Lord is the one uh, that does the saving, and we need to remember that. Going on from this. Uh, a different perspective on uh, Christianity that leads us into our worship. You know, we need to have a godly perspective on of worship and what worship is and how we are to do so. We're not going to dive greatly into this. We're just going to mention a couple of things. John four twenty four. You know, you know, it says God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we need, do need to worship God in the uh, in the right spirit in the truth. And that's what all of these are today. I told you we're using the word perspective a little loosely today. Maybe it's not the best word, but really we're just trying to drive home this idea today that our viewpoint, that, that our perspective is a godly perspective, is a perspective of truth, is 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 not just a, as the world likes to use, just a, a viewpoint. This is truth, uh, and we can, we can uh, you know, as people have said, take it to the bank. It is fact. Uh, and so John 4, 24, you know, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so one thing we'll mention is Ephesians chapter like five verse nineteen uh, and other passages uh, that reference this. Just in reference to our worship, one of the one of the things we do in our worship is sing. 
Uh, that is what has been uh, uh, told to us to do. That is what we have been instructed to do, to do in the New Testament uh, is to sing. And so this is just one aspect of worship. So many others that we could use, um, but it does not give us permission there in these verses talking about you know our, our worship and song. Uh, it does not give us permission to uh, to play instruments. It does not give us the in, uh, you know permission to not sing. Uh, he actually tells us to sing, uh, so we can kind of uh, you know uh, make sure that we're worshiping God in the right way. That we're giving Him proper worship as He has commanded us to. And then our our perspective, our viewpoint of leadership. You know, it needs to be a godly perspective. It needs to be uh, one that is coming also from truth. Um, you know, in First Timothy chapter two and verses eight through fifteen, you know, you see, you see that, that that the men were to be praying, that the women were not to teach or have authority over over the man. You see that that God intended not only in the marriage but also in His church that for for men to take this leadership role, uh, to be the ones that are leading, to be the ones that are, are you know in in this authority as God has intended. And in First Timothy chapter three, verses one through seven, you talk about elders. You go on uh, later in, talk, in that same chapter and talk about deacons. That both of these uh, you're going to see are to be married men. Uh, if they're married, they're married to one spouse, and uh, you know, and you see you see this that that these are to be married men, and the fact that, it, that they, it's married men excludes uh, women from falling uh, and being uh, in these categories to be in deacons, to be in elders. Uh, it, it takes them them out of this, and so we see today that all these things we mentioned seven things already today. Uh, you know, a renew pr- renewing our perspective of God, of creation, of mankind, of marriage, Christianity, worship, leadership. All these things are is just going back to God's way of viewing things, God's way of seeing things. And so, I want us today, as we close, to think about our, just our perspective on life. You know, what are we here for? Uh, why are we living? Uh, what's our purpose? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, you know, we see that, that, that man's whole, that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's what we're here for. We're here to, to serve God. We're here to love God. We're here to keep his commandments, be obedient to him, uh, to be in, in the church, to be his workmanship, uh, to be people that are, that are working for God, that are serving God. Our mind and our way of thinking has to be uh, the way that God uh, has instructed us to be and, and and in fact, in Colossians chapter three, uh, chapter three and verse two, you know that 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 we're our mind is to be set on things above, not on things of this earth. That our mind is to be focused on things that are godly, on things that are uh, that are, have that God has authorized, that God has told us are truth, uh, and that even even through evidence we have seen to be uh, true through so many evidences. Our perspective on life uh, is to be good. Uh, is to be godly. Um, I, th- I think about you know all of this in connection with the way our minds our minds are to work in, in general. Uh, Philippians chapter four and verse eight that all these good and pure things, these noble things, those are the kind of things that are being in our mind that we're to meditate on day in day out. This is to be our perspective on life. Just in general today, what we're trying to say is that we need to renew our perspective and put things in the way that God has set them up has structured them to put our perspective in the way of truth, or in the pathway of truth, and let truth, let God be our driving force in our life. If today, if you have heard these things and you've seen them in Scripture and you see that, hey, I need I need to change uh, and get back to the way that God sees them, that today, that's a day that we all need to make those changes that we need to make to make sure that we are living our life in the proper perspective.